so. Yeah, she's great. So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I apologize. Mama mia, that was... I was stuck in the traffic for one and a half hour, and I lost my phone. And so I, I, I ran out twice and asked strange people to give me their phone that I could make phone calls, but it didn't work. You know, I told the receptionist at the hotel he should drive directly to the university, and she told him, I'm coming in a few minutes. So he was waiting there for one, one hour. So everything went wrong, but now we start properly. Thank you very much that you're still here. Uh, I think it's worth uh, that you stayed. It will be a very interesting presentation. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends of the Europa Institute, dear Justice Na Andrew Napolitano, with a little bit delay, it's a great honor to have you here at the university uh, tonight. We are proud to have you here among us. You are going to talk about a very topical topic, if I can say so. It's Donald Trump. Does the U.S. system of checks and balances really work? This is not the first public lecture you have here in, at the Zurich University. You were here already a few years ago in 2000, and what was it? Uh, 18, I think, right? 2018. Yes when you gave, and you made the Zurich lecture, and you gave a speech on the topic, the American Constitution as its protection of personal liberties. Since then, 2018, a lot has changed. Donald Law, uh, Trump has lost the second term of his uh, presidential bid against Joe Biden. We are having a war in Ukraine. China is trying in a way to expand in the Asian Pacific area. And you, you have left Fox News. <laughs> Fox News was your home for about 22 years. You appeared there every day on TV, on the screen. Uh, you were there to comment on ongoing legal developments, constitutional developments in the United States you became very famous all over the United States uh, for doing that. Um, you have been a constitutional law teacher. You have been a superior judge in New Jersey. And you have left this position to go into private practice and also then to work for uh, the medias. Now, since 2022, if I'm right, or 21, now you are completely independent. You have, in a way, your own network. You are recording and commentating every day on your uh, different networks you are building up. And um, you have hundreds of thousands of followers. Like, I don't know. I'm not in that sphere. But I was told that this is the case. So you are still there and talk to the American public. Now, tonight, you're going to talk uh, to us. Um, you are going to talk about Donald Trump. Does the U.S. system of checks and balances really work? We are very interested to learn what you have to say. Please, it's yours the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> so you can put the, uh, the numbered uh, cases up on the screen, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for waiting for me. I apologize for being late. I'm one of these people who after yelling at lawyers for being late, is always on time himself, but we had some sort of a mix-up uh, in our communication. Uh, I spoke yesterday at the law school, and as I was uh, coming upon the campus, a woman, an American, came up to me and said, Judge Napolitano, Judge Napolitano, I heard you were dead. <laughs> now, how do you answer that? I looked at her and I said, Madam, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> You, you're on television five times a day for 25 years, and then you stop, and they think you're in, uh, in the grave. Um, uh, Professor uh, Keller Halls and I have been friends for many years. We actually uh, met through the late, great Justice Antonin Scalia, who uh, formerly uh, gave these uh, lectures. Attempting to fill his shoes is a very difficult task, but one that I have attempted uh, for two years now, and of course I'm deeply grateful to Professor Kellerhaus for uh, the opportunity to attempt to do that. The lecture that I gave uh, yesterday was on the separation of powers under the U.S. Constitution, 
how the legislative branch, the Congress, writes the laws, the executive branch, the president, enforces the laws, the judicial branch interprets the laws and decides what they mean. Problems, of course, come about when the barriers between the three branches breaks down, as is uh, often the case. But the fact that we have three branches, that they are jealous of each other, that they can each tell the other what to do, is really what we call checks and balances. Uh, this was uh, the genius of James Madison, uh, who was the uh, fourth president of the United States, was a young uh, legal scholar at the time that the Constitution was uh, drafted. The purpose of the separation of powers is to assure that too much power does not accumulate in one branch. If the president tries to take power away from the Congress, the courts uh, will stop him. If the courts try to take power away from the president, the Congress will cut the court's budget. So there's obviously uh, internal mechanisms to assure that the checks and balances work. Uh, how do the checks and balances come into play with respect to Donald Trump? Well, first, a little bit of background, a little bit of my bona fides. Uh, I have been a personal friend of Donald Trump for 40 years. Uh, we first met when his sister, also a judge in New Jersey, was a colleague of mine, and she invited me over to her home for dinner one night. She said, do you want to meet my brother? I said, who's your brother? I mean, nobody had heard of him at the time. He was a well-known builder and developer uh, in New York City, but no one could have imagined he'd ever be president of the United States. And then when I left the bench, uh, even though it's a lifetime appointment in the canton of New Jersey, <laughs> uh, and, and, and the states are different. In most states in the U.S., the, the uh, state judges run for office. New Jersey follows the federal model. You're appointed and confirmed appointed by the chief executive, the governor, appointed, uh, confirmed by the state senate, you have the job for life. Uh, when I left the bench, because I was tired of being poor, uh, and television uh, came along, I never imagined that I would be lecturing the future president of the United States on the Constitution, but it turns out that whenever I was on television, he was listening to me, and then as he started to get more active politically, he came on air with us, which is how I got to know him better. So on many, many occasions, uh, I was with him and, and interrogated him in front of cameras uh, on live television about whatever the issues of the day were. And indeed, uh, in his years in the White House, uh, he um, uh, called me many, many, many times, sometimes over frivolous nonsense that happened on television, but was of interest to him, other times over very profound issues, but we had many conversations. In the American system, the president appoints the justices of the Supreme Court and all federal judges, and the Senate confirms them. Donald Trump interviewed me twice for the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, he didn't appoint me to the court, which is why I'm here today. <laughs> so I give you this background in order to establish for you my bona fides to make comments on these cases. I have no animosity toward him at all. In fact, we are still... Uh, friends, my, my comments about these cases will be what I honestly believe is the law vis-a-vis -vis the, the statutes and vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution and vis-a-vis -vis public policy uh, in New Jersey. What did I do? Oh, oh, all right, right. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, Mr. President. <laughs> he would often call and say things like, I just saw you on air you were a little rough on my boy, meaning his son. And I would say, well, why do you call him a boy? He's the same age as your friend, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France. He's not my friend, and you know it. I said, yes, I know. I'm trying to get under your skin a little bit. Well, you succeeded in getting under my skin. All right. We start with these uh, cases up there. The, the first one is the one that received tremendous publicity not too long ago. This involves the so-called hush money to a, a female pornography actress by the name of Stormy Daniels. Now, Stormy Daniels alleges, and there's photographic evidence of this, met Donald Trump at a golf outing. Uh, he invited her to dinner. She claims that they had 
three sexual liaisons in return for which he promised to pay her by putting her on his television show, The Apprentice. When he did not put her on the show, more or less in her mind reneged on the contract they had entered into, sex three times in return for the show, she decided to go public with her relation with him. Of course, the time she decided to go public was October of 2016. What was Donald Trump doing in October of 2016? Running against Hillary Clinton for President of the United States. So the last thing in the world he wanted was for this pornography actress, well known in the United States, although little advanced in years for this type of performance, um, uh, communicated with the campaign and said, you know, you could buy my story from me. Another way, a way of saying you could buy my silence. So the campaign paid her $130,000 uh, in order to remain silent. And how did the campaign pay her? That's the issue. That's the legal problem here. It wasn't the campaign that paid her because that would not have been a, le a legitimate campaign expenditure. It was the Trump Organization, which is the umbrella corporation uh, owned by Donald Trump and his family. He has 3,472 corporations. They are all owned by this umbrella uh, corporation. Uh, it's, the, it's the parent corporation, and the parent corporation wired money to Donald Trump's lawyer, who wired money to a, a corporation in Delaware, who wired the money to Stormy Daniels' lawyer in California, who took his one-third of the fee and paid the rest to Stormy Daniels. The problem was that uh, on the books of the Trump Organization, this payment was booked as an ordinary, reasonable, legal expense. Of course, it wasn't a legal expense. Uh, it was uh, hush money to get this woman to remain silent. Now, hush money in America is lawful, is lawful. But if you try and deduct it, as an ordinary and reasonable uh, business expense, you have defrauded the tax authorities. If you don't tell your campaign, um, the, the entities to which you have to report in your campaign called the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, uh, that you have spent this money this way and claim that it's a legal expense, then you've defrauded the Federal Election Commission. So what has Trump been indicted for? He's been indicted for 34 false bookkeeping entries because when they wired this money to his lawyer, a fellow named Michael Cohen, they didn't wire the $130,000 all at once. They broke it down into little pieces so that if anybody examined the books, it would look like, oh, every month they were paying him some money to be their lawyer. In fact, he wasn't doing anything for them. He was just the conduit to receive the money and pay it to a Delaware corporation that he owned and wire it to Stormy Daniels lawyers um, in, uh, in California. So the charge is the false reporting of an expenditure in a corporation in order to hide another felony. What was the other felony? Well, the failure to pay income tax on this money. If it's an ordinary reasonable business expense, then nobody pays income tax on it. What other felony was involved? Uh, the use of uh, corporate funds to pay a campaign debt. The campaign debt was to silence this woman so the campaign wouldn't have to spend money uh, refuting what she said with only two weeks left in the campaign against Mrs. Clinton. This is at least the theory of the charge against him. Uh, Donald Trump's defense to this charge will be, this is nothing but a bookkeeping error. And what does the government care about a bookkeeping error? I don't keep my own books. Somebody else kept the books. Somebody else concocted this scheme. All I did was say, silence this woman. I don't want to have to deal with her. I never met her. I never had sex with her. Well, that was a mistake when he said he never met her because she has photographs of them hugging and kissing, not of doing anything else. The potential penalty here is five years in prison. It is unlikely that Donald Trump or anybody would go to prison for this who doesn't have 
a prior criminal record because this is one of those uh, crimes uh, for which absent a prior criminal record, the, the rules that judges follow, just basically a, a checklist uh, in assessing a, uh, a penalty, indicate that there should be no uh, incarceration, no period of incarceration. So if he is convicted, it'll be uh, a hefty fine and some uh, embarrassment. Uh, the trial is scheduled for March of 2024, which is right of the height, right at the height of the uh, Republican presidential primaries, in which if he is still in the race at that point in time, he will be running against a variety of other uh, Republican candidates uh, for uh, the nomination to compete against Joe Biden. Uh, the second charge uh, up there is uh, the state of Georgia versus Donald Trump. Now, he has not yet been indicted. I'll explain to you indictment, although I think a, pro a lot of you probably know what it is. America follows the British system, where you commence a criminal prosecution with an indictment. An indictment is a charge written on a piece of paper voted on by a grand jury. A grand jury is 23 citizens who meet in private, in secret. Only the government is there to present the government's case. In theory, if the grand jury agrees with the government that there is a case there, there is what we call probable cause, meaning it is more likely than not that the government is right that this defendant did commit this crime, then the grand jury will formally charge the defendant. In the federal system and in most states, that is the only way to commence a criminal uh, prosecution. We do not have investigating uh, magistrates as they do in Europe. The investigators are detectives who work for the prosecutors. The only check on the prosecutor's charging authority is the grand jury, to the extent that it's a check. Because in the grand jury, the defendant isn't there. There is no judge there. There is only the prosecutor and his witnesses there. So the grand jury invariably does whatever the prosecutor wants. In fact, a very famous uh, judge in New York uh, once coined the phrase, a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich if the prosecutor asked it to. <laughs> it's almost literally true. Every once in a while, a grand jury will vote by majority vote what's called a no bill a fancy old English phrase for, we're not going to charge this person no matter what the government says. But in the vast majority of times, well into the 99 percentile, the grand jury does what the government asks it to do. Can the defendant testify before the grand jury? Answer, yes, but that very, very rarely happens because the defendant has not been in the grand jury room. The defendant doesn't know what the government has told uh, the grand jury. The defendant may very well be denying an allegation for which he hasn't even been accused. So defendants have the right to come before a grand jury, but a, a, an experienced criminal defense lawyer would always advise the defendant not to exercise that right because you may get yourself in more trouble. Now, why is all of this in secret? All of this is in secret just in case the grand jury decides not to indict, then the public never knows that the defendant was even the subject of a grand jury investigation. This, of course, is ridiculous in the case of Donald Trump because there are no secrets with him. Uh, he, he is uh, his own uh, biggest me megaphone and his own worst enemy in terms of revealing everything. When he was indicted in this case, actually before he was indicted, he got on national television, I'm talking about the New York case, number one up there, uh, and said, I'm about to be arrested by the NYPD, the New York Police Department. Shall we do this on television? Of course, when he said this, this resulted in hundreds of thousands of people showing up outside the courthouse to see if he was going to be in handcuffs and in an orange jumpsuit as they usually do to defendants in New York. In fact, he was treated with a little bit more dignity uh, and respect. The crowds were there. The, the arraignment uh, wasn't much of a, very, uh, of a very big deal. Georgia and New York are two of the states that follow the federal rule 
which means that you must commence the prosecution with an indictment. So just as a grand jury heard all of these witnesses in New York and indicted them up there under number one in the 34 counts of false bookkeeping in order to hide or mask a more serious felony, excuse me, a grand jury uh, in Georgia will do the same thing. Now you may say, well, judge, hasn't a grand jury in, in Georgia already been investigating him? And isn't there a 486-page report out there? Short answer to both questions is yes. Georgia has a system different from all of the other cantons in New Jersey. And in the Georgia system, you have two grand juries. One does the investigation, and one does the charging. So the grand jury that does the investigation hears all of the witnesses, evaluates all of their testimony, and produces a report. They then give that report to another grand jury, which reads the report and decides whether or not to indict. So that report is in the possession of a judge in Atlanta, Georgia. He uh, released only the first 10 pages and the last 10 pages of it. He did not release any pages that mention any defendants' names on it. But we expect that Donald Trump and the very well-known former mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani, will be indicted by this, George, this uh, Georgia state grand jury sitting in Atlanta, Georgia, which is the capital of the state. Now, what is the charge here? Well, you will recall how Americans elect the president. We do not directly vote for the president. We vote for electors, and electors choose the president. Each state has a number of electors that roughly uh, approximate its population. So California has 45 electors. New Jersey has 11 electors. Georgia has 16. It has 14 representatives in the House of Representatives and two senators. So you have the number of electors that is equivalent to your representatives in the House and your senators. Every state has two senators, the number of representatives is roughly proportionate to the population. The state of Montana, which has fewer than a million in population, has one representative and therefore three electors, two senators, one representative. It's not the same people, which is part of this issue, as are in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. It's just the same number. So when Joe Biden won the popular vote in Georgia, that automatically elected Georgia's 16 electors who promised to vote for Joe Biden when they meet in the Electoral College on January 6, 2021. That, that date will come back to us. It will also come back to haunt uh, Donald Trump. Trump decided that the race in Georgia was so close, Biden won by 11,780 votes, that there might be some way that yeah, they could find 7,800 votes to switch the election to Trump, and if they did that in two other states, then Trump would win the election. In order to do that, he dispatched Rudy Giuliani to go down and speak to the legislature of the state of Georgia and Rudy Giuliani, he lost his license to practice law for saying this, told the legislature that Donald Trump really won the election because Biden's people had stuffed the ballot boxes with uh, false uh, ballots, none of which was true. Then Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump found 16 Republican electors who signed documents telling the federal government that they were truly chosen by the electors of the state of Georgia, not the 16 Democrats who were chosen because Joe Biden won the popular vote in the state, if you're still with me. <sighs> so Donald Trump is about to be indicted for orchestrating a conspiracy to overturn the election, which he lost in Georgia, 
to Joe Biden. And the government is about to indict Donald Trump, conspirator, Rudy Giuliani, agent of the conspiracy, and the 16 electors, Republican electors, who forged the documents claiming that they were the true electors. Now, when there is a conspiracy, an agreement by more than two people to commit a crime, where one person who's at least one person who's a party to the agreement takes a step in furtherance of it, that's the definition, that's the classic definition uh, of a conspiracy. And there's a conspirator that the government really wants to convict. The government will usually go to some of the lesser known conspirators and offer them something in return for their testimony. So the government of Georgia has gone to the Republican electors, the ones who weren't really the electors, the ones who forged the documents saying they were and said, we will give you immunity. We will promise never to prosecute you if you will testify against Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump. So all of this is about to come out in number two up there uh, in late July or early August, where Trump will be indicted by a grand jury in Atlanta, Georgia, for a conspiracy to, uh, to overturn uh, an election, and Rudy Giuliani uh, will be uh, indicted as well. The penalty for this is also five years, and this is also... Um, a, a crime for which people ordinarily do not go to jail if they have no prior criminal record. Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani do not have a prior uh, criminal record. Rudy himself was once uh, a federal prosecutor, a notoriously successful and well-known federal prosecutor who put many mafia families out of uh, business and prosecuted terrorists even before 9-11, before they were fair game because the government changed the laws to make it easier uh, to prosecute them. Uh, but I would think that Rudy Giuliani will say, well, I actually thought that Trump did win. And Trump will say, all these phone calls that I had to all these people in Georgia, they were perfect phone calls. There was nothing wrong with them. I just asked them to recount the ballots. I didn't ask them to create balance, ballots. Unfortunately for uh, Trump, uh, all of this is recorded. All of his uh, conversations uh, are being uh, recorded. I'm going to stop for a minute and I'll tell you a story about a, a conversation being recorded. So shortly before he left office, Trump called me up and said, I'm thinking of pardoning the following people. I want you to give me your opinion on all of them. So I did. He read the name to me. He's in the Oval Office. I'm in New York. He read the name to me, and I said, I think you should pardon that person. I think you should pardon that person. Yes, you should pardon that person. We went through the list, and I said, by the way, how are you doing? And he said, ah, not too well. You know, I'm, 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 I, I think I won the election, and, and old Joe is uh, going to come in. I said, you know, you made some promises you haven't kept yet. And he said, what's that? And I said, well, you promised that you would open up and release the full government investigation of the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He did make that promise. And I said, and you made that promise not only publicly, you made it to me many times. And he said to me, and he said to me, Judge, if you had seen what they showed me, you would not have released the file either. And I said, well, Mr. President, who's they and what did they show you? <laughs> and then he said, all right, Judge, someday when there aren't 15 people listening to my phone calls, <laughs> I will tell you. Now, I have not spoken to him since then, so I don't know who the they was or, who the, or what they showed him. The 15 people listening to his phone calls is White House uh, protocol. There's all kinds of people that listen to every phone call uh, from uh, the president. When he calls you, you know he's calling you because on your uh, mobile device comes up 10 zeros. 
That's how you know. That's how you know it's the uh, it's the White House uh, calling calling you. Uh, so you can expect this uh, indictment uh, in Georgia to come down this summer. Uh, how do we know it's going to come down this summer? Because the Georgia authorities have co have canceled all vacations and overtime for the police. <laughs> because again, they expect a mob of people not to to prevent him from getting to the courthouse, but to cheer him on as he's on his way into the courthouse to formally be arraigned or cheer him on as he's on his way out of the courthouse. Uh, number three up there, United States versus Trump. Now we're in the federal system, which is far more uh, treacherous uh, for uh, Donald Trump. And this is the infamous events that occurred in the American Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on January 6, uh, 2021. On January 6, 2021, by the Constitution, the House of Representatives and the Senate meet together as one body in order to count the electoral votes and to certify who is going to be the next president. If they cannot meet or if they cannot issue this certification, then there is no next president. January 6th was the day, of course, that about 780 people stormed the Capitol building. Some people say it was a peaceful political demonstration <laughs> by, by supporters of Trump who just wanted to say, we think he really run the elect, won the election. Uh, the government says, this was an effort to obstruct justice, to overthrow the government of the United States, to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. Five people died, uh, two, uh, three by heart attacks, one uh, killed uh, by the police, another uh, died arguably because of this, but um, a few days uh, afterwards. Uh, the damage was well uh, into the millions. Uh, the government continues to prosecute uh, people who were involved in this. Uh, the government's favorite prosecution is always conspiracy, because conspiracy is a charge where the government does not have to prove that the conspirators were successful. The government does not have to prove harm. In the American federal system, the government has to prove intent, and it has to prove harm, except for conspiracy. It has to prove intent, that the conspirators intended to agree to something, but it does not have to prove harm, because by definition there is no harm, because the conspiracy was not successful. If the conspiracy was successful, it wouldn't be a conspiracy, it would be the actual commission of the crime. So Trump will be charged with conspiracy to obstruct a governmental function that function is the joint meeting of the House and the Senate to count the electoral votes, which Trump knew at the end of that count, they would literally count the ballots one by one, uh, the vote would be in favor of Joe Biden. How did Trump get involved in this? Well, Trump gave a speech uh, across the street from the Capitol building and basically said, there's the Capitol, Let's go. It's going to be wild. <laughs> what does that mean? Whatever it meant, the mob ran to the Capitol and stormed it. So A, he's going to be in charge with inciting a riot. B, he's going to be charged with conspiracy to uh, obstruct justice, prevent the House and the Senate from counting the votes. And C, he's going to be charged with malfeasance in office failure to stop the riot because he is the chief executive officer on federal property. He could have picked up a phone and said to the military, which is in charge of security in the Capitol District, go stop those rioters. They're threatening members of Congress. They're destroying property. They're preventing a governmental function. Instead, there's videotapes of him in the White House watching the rioters on television, and cheering them on. <laughs> now, of course, the grand jury has seen these tapes of him cheering them on, and the grand jury has seen tapes 
of his uh, speech across the street from the Capitol. Does he have um, a First Amendment defense? Well, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Madison insisted on the word the. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech because Madison believed, as did I think most of the framers, certainly Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, that freedom of speech is a natural right, that it comes from your humanity. This is not a positive right. It doesn't say Congress shall grant the freedom of speech. It says Congress shall not interfere with the freedom of speech. Well, if freedom of speech existed before Congress did, before the Constitution was written, where did it come from? To Madison, to Jefferson, it was a, and is a natural right that comes from our humanity, and the First Amendment restrains it. Okay, that's a, 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 a two-minute explanation of what takes a month in law school and about 40 or 50 Supreme Court cases to go through. Aha! What about a person who incites violence? Is that the freedom of speech? So in a famous case called Brandenburg, Brandenburg versus Ohio, where a horrible, despicable uh, um, uh, Ku Klux Klan white racist guy said, let's go to Georgia, let's, he's in Ohio, and says, let's go to Washington and take the government back from, and then he used crude words for African Americans and the Jewish people, and he was uh, convicted uh, in Ohio state courts, upheld by the Ohio Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court reversed it unanimously and said, all innocuous speech is absolutely protected, and all speech is innocuous when there is time for more speech to challenge it. So, Trump says, there's the Capitol, let's go. It'll be wild. And the mob attacks the Capitol. Question, was there time between Trump's utterance of his words and the mob's attack for Trump's words to be neutralized? That is a highly technical First Amendment-based defense based on this case Brandenburg uh, versus Ohio, uh, but it is more likely than not the defense uh, that he will use. Uh, in American history, there's a very famous uh, lawyer by the name of Clarence Darrow. Uh, I'm actually doing a one-man show, if you happen to be in New York City in the fall, called Off-Broadway. So Off-Broadway theaters are about this size by New York City law. Only New York would have a law like this. They can't have more than 199 seats. If they have more than 199 seats, then they're called Broadway. If they have 199 or fewer, they're called Off-Broadway. So this one-man show that I'm doing is called Clarence Darrow Tonight, in which I will become Clarence Darrow, and in the process of doing this, we'll be recounting some of his more famous arguments to judges and juries. Here is one of his famous ones about conspiracy. Now, I'm going to use a, a, uh, a numerical amount of money that was relevant when he said it. It would be irrelevant today. If a boy steals a dime, he's not going to go to prison. A small fine will be enough to cover what the boy did. But if two boys... There he is again. Ten zeros on the phone. But if two boys conspire to steal a dime and then don't steal it, the government will charge them with conspiracy and they will go to jail. And then he looks at the jury and says, what kind of a country does this? Answer, ours. And it was one of those crazy conspiracy cases around the time of World War I, and, and his, his clients were acquitted in large measure because of arguments like this. The government loves conspiracy cases. They don't have to prove harm. They don't have to prove success. They only have to prove the agreement, and the conspirators don't even have to know each other. 
Trump could have conspired with the 780 people that attacked the building, even though he didn't know any of them in person. Only has to show an agreement and one step by one conspirator in furtherance of the agreement. Prediction, he will be convicted. This, he will be uh, indicted. I don't know if he'll be convicted. If he is convicted, this is 10 years in prison and the presumption is in favor of incarceration even though there is no prior. And those two state cases, New York and Jersey, number one and number two, uh, New York and Georgia, number one and number two uh, up there, the presumption, even if convicted, is no incarceration. In the federal system, in number three up there, if he's convicted, the presumption is in favor of incarceration. In America, the judge does the sentencing. The jury decides guilt or innocent. The judge does the sentencing. So when a judge is told by law the presumption is in favor uh, of incarceration, then it is the defendant's job to prove why he should not be incarcerated. It would be a difficult job for Trump to prove that he should not be incarcerated if he is convicted of this conspiracy to prevent the passage of power from him to Joe Biden. Now, what Trump forgot, well, I forgot a lot, but, but, what, but what Trump forgot is that his term would be over at noon on January 20th, whether Joe Biden succeeded him or not. He thought, you know, when I was talking to him before he was president, I said to him, you know, you're, you're about to take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. This is after he was elected. He had just defeated Mrs. Clinton, and before he was being sworn in in January. The election's in November, the inauguration's in January. I said, you're about to take an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Have you ever read it? He looks at me, he goes, I don't read books. I haven't read a book since I graduated from Penn. I'm thinking, my God, you're, never, you're telling me this, that means you never read a book at Penn, an, an Ivy League school. Not as good as Princeton, but a, but a very fine, very fine uh, Ivy League uh, school. I said, Mr. President, depending upon the size of the print, it's only 27 pages. Can I give you a copy? I won't read it. I have people like you to tell me what's in it. I don't need to read the Constitution. Well, if he did read it, he would have known that his term ended at noon on January 20th, whether Joe Biden was the lawful successor to him or not. Who would have become the President of the United States? A woman he despised more than he hates Joe Biden, Mrs. Nancy Pelosi. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> but as the Speaker of the House of Representatives, without a valid President or Vice President having been elected, she is next in line. Okay, the last of our cases. I think I'm going a little bit over, and I apologize for that. And again, I apologize for... I apologize for getting here late. I got lost. I couldn't find Andy. It was all, good, all kinds of crazy nonsense going on. He, he promised me a dinner at an Italian restaurant. I thought we were supposed to meet at the restaurant. I mean, it's just one of those things. So if I've ruined your evening, you, you have my, my profoundest uh, apologies. Um, United States versus Trump, too. This is by far and away the most serious charge against him. And this is the documents at Mar-a-Lago. Mar-a-Lago is the name of his estate in Palm Beach, one of the largest houses uh, in the United States of America. It's also a private uh, country club uh, that he uh, runs uh, and manages there. Um, in the two summers ago, uh, while Donald Trump was at another country club that he owns in New Jersey, 50 FBI agents showed up at Mar-a-Lago with a search warrant. This is the first time in American history that the home of a former president has been subject to an FBI search. Now, in order to get a search warrant in America, pursuant to the Fourth Amendment, it's right in the Constitution, some of the more precise language in the Constitution is in the Fourth Amendment addressing this issue. The government must go to a judge, a neutral judge, and present to that judge probable cause of crime meaning it is more likely than not that the place that we want to search and the things we want to seize 
are evidence of crime, and here's how we know it. The judge will ask questions, and if the judge agrees, the judge signs the search warrant. So the FBI and federal prosecutors, unbeknownst to Donald Trump, approached a federal judge and said, we believe that he has, do you see the initials up there? N-D-I, under number four. Yeah, right there. Oh, I thought they were numbered, sorry. So under the last one, N-D-I. We believe he has NDI. Everybody knows what NDI is, right? So you can talk about this in a cocktail conversation tonight. NDI is national defense information. Doesn't say classified. Because the FBI set a trap for him. They waited until he went to New Jersey. They knew he was in New Jersey because they had people working for him who were telling them of his whereabouts. And then they showed up at 6 in the morning. They called the Secret Service that guard the house because you don't want what's known as, I'm looking at this young man's shirt. You'll remember this now. It's called blue on blue. That's where cops fight cops. You don't want the FBI to get in a fight with the Secret Service. So the FBI calls up the Secret Service saying, eh, we're outside the house. There's 50 of us. We have a search warrant. What? We know he's not there. You got to let us in. Of course, we'll let you in. If they had just burst their way in, as they normally do, they would have been met with gunfire from the Secret Service, the so-called, your shirt again, blue on blue. So in order to prevent this, uh, the FBI calls ahead of time. Donald Trump is, gets a phone call from someone in the House saying, you're not going to believe it, there's 50 FBI agents here, and they're everywhere. So Trump, in his golf club in New Jersey, throws a switch and turns on the security cameras in Mar-a-Lago. So he's in his house in New Jersey watching them search his house in Florida. He calls up Fox News and says, ah, they don't know what they're looking for. I already declassified all those documents. Now, what is he doing by saying that? He's breaking the first rule of criminal procedure, which is don't deny until after you've been accused. He was not accused of classified documents. He was accused of NDI, National Defense Information, which is always and everywhere criminal for anyone to possess, including the sitting president of the United States, outside of a federal facility. So when he says, ah, don't worry about it, I declassified them by thinking about it. By thinking about it, I declassified them. He admitted he had them. <laughs> then they played another trick on him. They took the documents and they threw them on the floor. The FBI did this right where his shoes would be when he was sitting in his office in Mar-a-Lago and they took a picture and they published that picture and he goes, they made me look like, slob, like a slob. I didn't keep the documents in that condition. <laughs> Admission number two. Of course, when he complained, because he saw them on the cameras, rummaging through Melania's shoe closet, we subsequently learned why they were there. Because one of the witnesses who testified uh, before the grand jury said, he gave me boxes of papers. He said they were very important papers and I shouldn't look at them because I didn't have the right to and I should hide them behind Mrs. Trump's shoes. So the FBI knew exactly where to go and what they were looking for. Now, why is this case so dangerous? Well, it's dangerous for a couple of reasons. The charge is espionage. And espionage carries a mandatory incarceration. Espionage is the failure to keep safe NDI, National Defense Information. And in this case, where the grand jury sits in Washington, D.C., Trump's lawyers, every single one of them, has testified against him before the grand jury. Well, how can that be? Isn't there the attorney-client privilege? 
Well, yes, there is. You're sitting in your office, you're a lawyer. The client comes in and he says, I just robbed a bank. What are my defenses? Okay, it wasn't you. You have an alibi. The money was already yours. You were insane. You were drunk. There's a variety of, uh, of defenses available to you. That conversation is privileged. Client comes in and says, I plan to rob a bank. What will my defenses be? That conversation is not privileged. That's called the crime fraud exception to the attorney-client privilege. So when the federal prosecutors subpoenaed Trump's lawyers, they're pulling their hair out. What are they, crazy? They want us to testify against him? They filed motions saying attorney-client privilege, and a judge held a trial in secret because it involves the grand jury. Everybody except Trump testified at that trial. At the end of the trial, the judge says, your client lied to you, tricked you, and caused you to defraud the government when you told the government that there were no NDI documents in the House. And his lawyers did tell that to the government. So all of his lawyers have testified before that grand jury. This is the, is the most lethal uh, case for Trump, a uh, lethal case uh, against him. Uh, there's a special prosecutor appointed for the NDI case um, uh, and for January 6th. It's the same special prosecutor. It's just, it, it divorces the prosecution from the everyday operation uh, of the Justice Department. Uh, all of the, all three of these, the, the people of the Trump, the first one up there, the investigation is, is done and the trial is set. And all the other three, the investigation is done. It's just a question of when the indictments uh, will be issued. The special counsel needs to get the permission of the Attorney General, Merrick Garland, who runs the Justice Department, in order to ask the grand jury for the indictment. Now, when they're about to indict you, you get what's called a target letter. And the target letter says, Dear Mr. Trump, grand jury sitting in Atlanta, Georgia, or Washington, D.C., whichever it may be, uh, is seriously considering an indictment against you. You have the right to come and testify before the grand jury. That would be insane if he did that, but he has the opportunity to do it. I believe that one of those um, hasn't been published yet. One of those target letters was sent. Why do I believe it? Because Trump and his lawyers wrote a letter to Merrick Garland the other day saying, we want to come and meet you. They wouldn't First of all, such a meeting would never occur, but they wouldn't be asking for that unless they knew uh, that an indictment was about to come. All right, let me deviate from all this Trump stuff uh, for just a minute um, and tell you the craziest thing that ever happened to me when I was on the bench and when I was trying cases uh, in New Jersey. So I'm trying a cocaine possession case. And the cops uh, stopped this car on a major highway in New Jersey uh, and, and found a tremendous amount of cocaine, so much cocaine uh, that the government is able to argue that this person was a dealer, that no one could use this much, that he possessed it uh, in order to distribute it. So when that happens, when, he, when he's indicted for that, the lawyers for the defendant make an application before the judge to suppress the evidence, meaning to force the government to prove how they got the cocaine. If they broke the law in order to get the cocaine, then the evidence is suppressed and the government can't introduce the evidence to the jury and therefore the defendant is, will walk, the defendant is scot-free. So these suppression hearings are very important. There's no jury, it's just the judge. So the state policeman is on the witness stand and he says, I stopped this car because it had a cracked tail light. Uh, now, as soon as I hear this, my radar goes up because I, this is their favorite excuse for stopping a car. It's such a favorite excuse that they sometimes crack the taillight after they stop the car and then take a picture of the crack and claim that that's what they saw. This guy, I'm looking at the paperwork. You saw the crack taillight? Yes. According to your paperwork, you were at mile marker 1002, right. And the car was at mile marker 10. Oh, seven. Right. That's a half a mile. You saw a cracked taillight a half a mile away? Who are you, Superman? No. 
As soon as I say this, the courtroom fills up with young people like this young man who are the clerks for the other judges in the courthouse because they know there's going to be some fireworks. What happened then? I stopped the defendant. I asked him to get out of the car. I patted him down, and I reached into his pocket and removed a brick. Ah, what's the law? The law is... When the police stop you, it's a legitimate legal stop, they can pat you down to see if you have a weapon before they interrogate you. And if you have the weapon, even if you legally have it, they can remove the weapon from you for the duration of the interrogation. So this cop says this guy had, as a weapon, a brick. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to go in the guy's pocket if it weren't a weapon. What did you do? I reached into his pocket, I pulled out the brick, and discovered, aha, it was a brick of cocaine. That's how you got the cocaine, yes. The cocaine was a brick, yes. Then I say to the prosecutor, where is the cocaine? Well, judge, it's right here. Bring me the cocaine. I'm going to squeeze it to see if it feels like a brick. <laughs> they hand me the bag of cocaine. At this point, it's standing room only in the courtroom. Nobody can imagine what's about to happen. Everything's being taken down by the stenographer. They take down everything. So when you do something that's nonverbal, you have to say what you're doing. The record will reflect that prosecutor so-and-so has handed the judge a plastic bag of cocaine when the judge is squeezing the bag to see if it feels like a brick. The bag breaks. Oh, my God, on my hair, my eyelashes, my robe, on the cop, on the prosecutor. All right, we're going to adjourn this thing, clean it up, get the vacuums, and now the government is furious at me. Judge Napolitano destroyed the evidence in the case. <laughs> but, of course, there's such a thing as judicial immunity, which prevents the government from going after judges, whatever they do, uh, on the bench. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. I don't know how these cases are going to end up, but you'll certainly read about it. God love you. Now, I'll take some questions. Thank you very, very much, Judge Napolitano. This was excellent and, and, and wonderfully told. It was uh, very entertaining and very enlightening. Um, we, we now have time for questions, if you, if you have questions. May, maybe a first one from me. After I, all I that... I fear this question the most. <laughs> like the ghost yeah. of Christmas future, I fear you the most. That's the privilege of being, you know, the moderator. Um, after all those four cases, would you bet that by the end of this year, Donald Trump will be in prison or not? What is it, 50, 60, 80 percent? If, if he's convicted of Mar-a-Lago, he will definitely uh, go to prison. Uh, the, if I could modify the question slightly, yeah. will he be the Republican candidate for president? Uh, when the first one came down, his, his poll numbers went up about 15 percent, up about 15 percent. So he will use all of this to portray himself as a victim. But, but this one, this last one, is is is. Lethal for his freedom. Lethal. Difficult to get out. Very difficult to get out. The most professional investigators, the most professional prosecutors, and statutes written and interpreted in a very pro-government way. And if he gets indicted, he can still be candidate for the presence? Yes. Yes. Uh, there's a um, famous case of... Um, uh, John Michael Curley, who was the president of, uh, uh, who was the mayor of Boston, uh, who was arrested for corruption, convicted, went to jail, and, and ran for re-election from his jail cell, <laughs> and won. <laughs> so they made a deal. Give up the mayoralty, and we'll let you out of jail. And he did. Um, can he run from a jail cell? Yes. Can he serve? No. Can he pardon himself once he was... A very jail? good question. Very good question and never been answered. He has told people in private, I know one of these people pretty well, <laughs> that he thinks he can pardon anybody. That, of course, would make him 
judge in his own case, which would defy the very core values of the American Constitution. Please. Oh, uh, settlement. I mean, uh, well, I was not. I was not there at the time it happened, so I was not a witness. Not I was. I was. A... I was not a witness in the case. So Dominion is the manufacturer of the voting machines. Uh, sued Fox News because of what Fox um, anchors and guests, former colleagues and still friends of mine, uh, said on air. Uh, when it turned out that they didn't believe what they were saying, but they said it because they thought that it would pander to the pro-Trump uh, Fox uh, audience. Uh, and what they said was uh, uh, profoundly untrue, that these voting machines were controlled by uh, Hugo Chavez, and some of them came from Indonesia, and <laughs> numbers didn't add up, and, and, and all kinds of crazy nonsense. Uh, but it was good for ratings. So the question was, was that uh, defamatory uh, in, in America when the... Uh, uh, plaintiff is a public figure, as Dominion is, it has to show knowledge of falsity on the part of the defendant or reckless disregard for the truth or falsity. Uh, they had so much evidence uh, that Fox anchors believed that what they were saying was false uh, that the case settled on the eve of picking a jury. It was the largest defamation settlement in the history of the United States. It was $787 million dollars. Well, what they're asking for, you're not even allowed to tell the jury. That's just a, uh, that's just a PR statement. I'll tell you how much money it is. They, the company was capitalized at $300 million. So they, they got three to, nearly three times what they were worth from Fox. Oh, it would have been quite a trial. Would have been quite a trial. <laughs> More questions? Of course so. Please. Yeah, you. In the blue shirt, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your speech. Um, in your opinion, do you think that the uh, American jury system and the judicial system in general? is capable of providing Donald Trump a fair and unbiased uh, trial? I mean, that, that is what we say in America, the $64,000 question. That's the question we really can't, can't answer. If I could modify the question a little bit, would the fact that he is the former president and running for president be taken into account by the jury? The answer the jury will be told that they must disregard that. Now, jurors are human beings. You know, uh, if a jury heard something that they shouldn't hear, you tell them to disregard it, they can't unhear it. That's really a public policy question. Is it worth what the country will go through during this prosecution? Is it worth it just to get him off the streets uh, and into a jail? That's a public policy decision. That's not an argument that can be made uh, to the uh, jury. Uh, whoever the judge is will have a difficult time, but We'll have to find 12 people that will say under oath, I will not be influenced uh, by politics whatsoever. Do you think there are 12 people like these uh, in, in the take U.S.? Long, it'll take a long time to find them. <laughs> if he gets convicted, could the case go up to the Supreme Court? Yes. And would that there be an issue that he appointed three of those justices on the court? Well, the present Supreme Court has ruled uh, against him five times already. Even, even with Justices uh, Gorsuch, uh, Kavanaugh, and Barrett there. Uh, so <clears throat> the fact that he appointed them does not bar them from uh, hearing cases in which uh, he's a party. This dispute about whether the lawyers could testify went all the way to the Supreme Court, and they decided not to hear it. Nine to nothing. So you trust in the American judicial system? I do. You know, I was a part of the American judicial system for the most formative part of my professional years. And it's not perfect, but it's the best system uh, we have. Mm -hmm. Sir. How much time do we 
Thank you for the question. One minute. No, a short, a short question as okay. always. Okay, you you want to hear the speaker, okay, not fine. your long question. Uh, so you have said, Mr. Napolitano, 50 FBI people went to Al Marco to his hotel. So the FBI was already in 2015 uh, uh, behind Trump when he was in Switzerland. And uh, James Comey was um, looking for him uh, here already uh, in the case that he has influenced, uh, he, that he was with uh, Russian agents, which they have been in Zurich. FBI is looking for some agents of them which have been here in Zurich. And he was in this case already for innocence. Natalia Natalavskaya was here. She was also in the Trump Tower, but she was also in Zurich before. And James Comey and his friends was here. But what is, the, que what is the question? Yes, the question is that already he has a big case where he was involved and they have uh, find anything. So here maybe the cases are with more facts. So like I wanted to ask, uh, but Professor uh, Alec, uh, Keller has said it already, uh, that the Supreme Court sits with him. And if in the end, maybe after four or five years when we have the final decisions that he Come will be Come to innocent. the question, please. That's the question. Okay. I think you're asking me if he can be prosecuted while he's in office, the answer is no. I think you're also asking me uh, the fact that he was uh, more or less exonerated in the Russia investigation. Uh, does that uh, put the FBI in a bad light? Yes. Uh, I don't think it will have any effect on, uh, on, these, on the third and the fourth one. The first two the FBI are not involved in because they're state cases. The third and the fourth one the FBI is deeply involved in. Your Honor, short, short question. You told us about these core values of U.S. Constitution, and uh, my question is, what is your core values, and what are they different from Trump's values, if, if it's possible? Oh, well, that, uh, what are my core values? Oh. I just wrote a legal treatise called uh, Freedom's Anchor, an introduction to natural law, jurisprudence, and American constitutional history, in which we reviewed every U.S. Supreme Court opinion that expressly accepts the content, a concept that our rights come from our humanity, or expressly rejects that concept. Uh, the book is 500 pages long, and there's 2,000 footnotes, and you're welcome to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> please, there's another question, please. Uh, Shell Neuburg, uh, professor of finance here at the University of Zurich. Uh, <clears throat> professor, my, my, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice meeting you, Judge. Uh, I have uh, many questions, but I'll limit myself to two. Uh, the, the first one is uh, how to understand the, the, the subtitle uh, of the talk, uh, because we have this, you know, we have the judiciary, we have the president, you know, the executive body, uh, there's some conflict here, so, but, you know, you didn't talk so much about, you know, how to interpret uh, the subtitle, uh, and I'm curious what the, what the punchline there is. Uh, well, the punchline there would be if Trump is convicted because the jurors, I forget who asked this before, hate him. Somebody asked me if we can have a, who asked if we can have a fair jury uh, trial? Right, good question. Uh, it, that would be uh, a basis for a reversal of the conviction. That would be the checks and balances working. That would be a, an appellate court uh, interfering with what the what the executive branch wants, which is a criminal prosecution based on crime, uh, by saying uh, he was truly convicted because the jurors hated him. And he'd have to make that uh, showing. But if he could make that showing after conviction, that would be a basis for reversal. So would the, uh, the check on the you know, previous uh, you know, president, Trump, would that be you know, that now he, he is being uh, you know, investigated? The, the, and what, what is the issue about whether he's getting a fair trial. The issue of whether the trial was fair comes to play in the appellate court. The check is the judicial branch preventing the government from punishing him even though he has already been convicted because the trial that the government uh, presented was, in the opinion of the appellate court, if they come to this opinion, inherently unfair, and so the result uh, was unjust. That's the check. And that is the duty of the uh, judiciary. The other two branches are popularly elected. The judiciary is anti-democratic. Its purpose is to preserve the life, 
liberty and property of the minority from the encroachment of the majority, which would be the majority in Congress and the majority that elected uh, the president for whom the prosecutors work. Thank you. Uh, my other question that I wanted to ask very quick, but you know, potentially a little bit uh, sensitive. So uh, with respect to the, the, the final uh, case, which is the, the serious case. Yes. Uh, there's also been uh, documents found in Biden's uh, home, in his office at, uh, I, I, yeah, I can't remember, the University of Cornell or something. Uh, what is the difference? Well, the difference is um, that Joe Biden surrendered them when the government asked for them. Because they're going to charge Trump with obstruction uh, of justice, uh, he did not surrender them. He hid them. The other difference is, is quantity. Uh, Trump had a few thousand documents, about 300 of which were in this NDI category. Biden had five, none of which, as far as I know, were in the NDI uh, category. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Do you professor. know why Trump took those documents? Yeah, out? it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, and knowing Trump's personality, as I do, I'm going to guess he took them to boast about them at a dinner party. Look at this: the, the Israeli <laughs> nuclear plans right here. <laughs> what? <laughs> this guy's drunk and he's looking. Now, Trump doesn't drink. There's somebody at the table is drunk and you're showing him the Israeli nuclear plans. The documents were Israeli, Iranian and Ukraine nuclear plans. That is the most sensitive stuff that the government has. How did the government get that? Ah, the government flipped an Israeli agent to steal it, flipped an Iranian agent to steal it, flipped a Ukrainian agent to steal it. If the names of those agents who were flipped came out, they would be tortured and executed by their government. That's why the US government protects this stuff so aggressively. Last question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it will be about the documents. You told us about the secret documents is, is NDI, and if you make it public, you get a crime. But sometimes these documents is violated the basic human rights. For example, with example of John uh, Edward Snow and WikiLeaks. Um, I, you know, I, I'm having trouble understanding you. Might you so say it again and a little slower? Yeah, uh, look. These documents that they pub publish, it was NDI the same way, uh, way but uh, it violated the human rights. For example, the government uh, violates the privacy of the people. Ah, uh -huh. all right. So, so is is the question: Can the contents of the of the documents exonerate the person who's accused of possessing them? Exactly. No, unfortunately. Uh, the, the examples are Julian Assange uh, in a London a solitary confinement cell awaiting extradition to the U.S. He published documents showing that George W. Bush administration uh, committed war crimes. It's a positive good that the American public uh, had that transparency, but he's still going to be prosecuted. The famous uh, Pentagon Papers case where Daniel uh, Ellsberg stole 7,000 pages of documents from the Pentagon and gave them to the New York Times and the Washington Post, which revealed that President Lyndon B. Johnson and his generals had been lying to the American public about the war in Vietnam. That's a positive good that the American public did that, uh, knew that, but he was still prosecuted. In that case, when he was prosecuted, the FBI broke into his psychiatrist's office during the trial in order to steal the psychiatrist's notes about him to give them to the prosecution. When the federal judge found out about this, he threw the case out. Today, of course, the FBI wouldn't have to break into the psychiatrist's office. They just have to get inside of this, mm. which they're in anyway. <laughs> <laughs> judge Napolitano, that was great. Thank you very much. Oh, very thank interesting you. and timely. Thank you. Thank you.